June 27, 2020 is World Pride Day, where communities around the world come together to celebrate the contributions and the presence of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, two-spirit, queer, and questioning individuals in their community, and to come to celebrate the vibrant colors that makes our communities so unique. When people think about countries in the world where LGBTQ people are respected and celebrated, Canada is often somewhere at the top of that list. Our Prime Ministers march in pride parades, our city halls and legislative assemblies fly the rainbow flag, and for almost two decades the running joke was that same-sex couples from the United States had to run across the border to Niagara Falls to get married because they still couldn't do that back home. Today, LGBTQ communities are as visible as they have ever been. Gay villages are vibrant areas that showcase LGBTQ pride all year round. From Church in Wellesley in Toronto and Bank Street Village in Ottawa, to Le Village Gay in Montreal and Davie Village in Vancouver, LGBTQ communities are visible in all corners of our country, from our biggest cities to our smallest rural towns. Canada was not always as open as it appears to be today, and there is still a lot of work to be done. This World Pride Day, I think it's really important for us to take a moment to remember how we got here. Why Pride is celebrated in Canada, what battles and sacrifices gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender Canadians had to face to get where we are today, and why celebrating Pride Month in 2020 is still important for everyone no matter if you're gay, straight, bi, or somewhere or nowhere in between. So here is to Pride Month 2020, to all of the gays, lesbians, and bisexuals, trans men and trans women, to our asexual, gender-fluid, and non-binary folk, to all of the drag queens, straight allies, and queers that are in my heart dear. Happy Pride, Canada. Before Europeans ever set foot on Turtle Island, the indigenous people of the Americas had a wide variety of traditions, practices, and beliefs surrounding queer identities, long before we could even call them those. It's important to note, however, that there were hundreds of different indigenous nations in what is now Canada, with hundreds of different languages and traditions. And many had different words that were assigned to individuals with those identities. Some cultures put an extreme amount of responsibility and respect on these individuals, recognizing their ability to be both a man and a woman or neither brings them significantly closer to the spirits of the land. The modern term Two-Spirit was created in the year 1990 at an international indigenous LGBTQ conference in Winnipeg. Despite being an English word, it's meant to carry the traditional meaning of the many terms in indigenous languages for culturally specific roles and responsibilities that are usually confirmed by an elder in the Two-Spirits community. And as such, it is not interchangeable for a gay indigenous person, and the term rejects the Western binary that the person is both a man and a woman. Obviously, the traditions of hundreds of independent nations are going to vary wildly, but the extensive family and trading networks that stretch from Alaska to the Yucatan would have meant that these sexual and gender identities were generally accepted across the continent. It wouldn't be until Europeans came to North America that they brought the idea of homophobia with them. The first ever recorded criminal trial for the crime of homosexuality happened in September 1648, in Ville-Marie, which is now on the island of Montreal. A military drummer stationed at the French garrison was sentenced to hang at the gallows for sodomy by the local priests. However, Jesuits in Quebec City, upon hearing of the hanging, intervened and asked that he become New France's first permanent executioner. Many historians believe that because it was just the drummer put on trial, his partner must have been First Nations, as they weren't subject to French laws. Under the British crown, things were not much better and any same-sex activity between men was punishable by death, although numerous men were sentenced to death under these laws. There are no surviving records of any executions actually being followed through in Canada. In 1842, two men, Patrick Kelly and Samuel Moore, were arrested for and charged with sodomy, and for the first time being charged for what the courts clearly describe as being consensual activity between the two men. Both men were sentenced to death and sent to the Kingston Penitentiary, but not before having their sentences commuted later that year. Moore would eventually be released in 1849, and Kelly would be released in 1853. In the early 1900s, underground LGBTQ communities were just starting to form. Les Mouches Fantastiques was an underground magazine that was first launched in Montreal in 1918, becoming the first known LGBTQ publication in North American history. 
Elsa Gidlow and Roswell George Mills published five issues of Les Mouches from Montreal before moving to New York City in the early 20s. Both were pioneers for their communities. Mills was the first gay man in Canada to have his sexuality and life story told through poems and stories and not through court documents. And Elsa was the first lesbian to publish an autobiography using her own name and not a pseudonym. Into the 1950s and 60s, the Canadian government was pouring millions of dollars into the investigation of homosexuals in Canada. They were trying really hard to root out any suspected homosexuality from the Canadian government, the RCMP, or the Canadian military. The RCMP kept tabs on gay bars and other gathering spaces in Ottawa and other cities, and even worked with the FBI to inform them when a suspected homosexual might be crossing the border. This was all happening alongside the Red Scare and the threat of attack from communism in the Soviet Union. Unit A was created to weed out any government officials that might have some problematic character traits according to the Canadian government. And homosexuals were seen as being potential communist and Soviet sympathizers. So, in the eyes of the government, the gays had to be weeded out, and so the third office of Unit A was formed. The unit printed out a large map of Ottawa and placed a little red dot everywhere that they suspected a gay person might live or spend some time. Soon that map was absolutely covered in red ink and had to be thrown out. So they printed an even larger map of the city. And after that happened again, not once, but twice, the mapping project was eventually cancelled. For those that the RCMP did suspect of being a homosexual, Unit A3 had access to something that they called the Fruit Machine. The Fruit Machine looked something like a dentist chair, and the suspected homosexual was meant to sit down was strapped in, and a small screen would be put in front of their face that would show a series of images from the mundane to the sexually explicit. And a small camera was pointed towards the individual's eyes to record any change in the size of his pupils. This was believed to gauge their reaction and level of interest. Funding for the fruit machine was eventually cut in the late 1960s. However, the RCMP had already collected files on over 9,000 suspected gay people, and a significant number of federal workers lost their jobs. Outside of government offices, the 1960s was starting to bring different ideas and perceptions into the minds of the general public. In 1964, ASK, the first gay-positive organization was launched in Vancouver and started publishing newsletters. Although new opinions were being considered, the law remained unchanged, and in 1965, George Clippert was arrested and became the last person in Canada to be arrested, charged, and convicted of gross indecency before homosexuality was decriminalized in 1969. Clippert was picked up by police in Pine Point, Northwest Territories to answer some questions about an arson that had been committed in the community. While in interrogation, he admitted to having sex with other men, and was charged with gross indecency. When psychiatrists decided that he was unlikely to stop having sex with other men, he was labeled a dangerous offender and was sentenced to life in prison. Around that time, the weekly news magazine Maclean's published an article that was sympathetic to homosexuals, and that led to increasing calls of change around Canada's homosexuality laws. By 1967, then-Justice Minister Pierre Trudeau introduced changes to the Criminal Code of Canada that would liberalize some of Canada's laws on social issues like homosexuality, abortion, and the use of contraception. Trudeau is famously quoted as saying, when talking about the decriminalization of homosexuality in Canada, that there is no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation. On June 27, 1969, the bill received royal assent and homosexuality was decriminalized in Canada. George Clippert would be released from prison two years later in 1971, but unfortunately would pass away in 1996. Justin Trudeau, our current Prime Minister, expressed plans to recommend a pardon for Clippert's conviction. However, as of June 2020, neither pardon nor expungement has happened. The decriminalization of homosexuality in Canada was not the final victory for the LGBTQ community. Far from it. But it was a critical first step. In 1971, the first ever gay protest, We Demand, was staged on Parliament Hill. 
and two years later, Pride Week 73 was a nationwide LGBTQ event, launching Canada's LGBTQ movement from a homophile movement, which was pushing for safe spaces for homosexuals to gather away from the mainstream, to a gay liberation movement, which was encouraging the acceptance and the celebration of the gay community within mainstream Canada. On October 10th of that same year, the city of Toronto became the first city in Canada and one of the first in the world to forbid the discrimination of employees and in the hiring process based on sexual orientation. The city's policies obviously didn't spread to everyone in Toronto right away, and especially not with some departments like the police. In 1974, four lesbians were enjoying the Brunswick House, a working class bar on Bloor Street in uptown Toronto. When they decided to sing their own version of the popular song, I Enjoy Being a Girl, called I Enjoy Being a Dyke. Halfway through their performance, the bar owner cut them off and asked them to leave, but not before already calling the police. When they declined to leave, they were surrounded by eight uniformed Toronto police officers and were arrested and brought down to the station. The women were not charged with anything, and to protest their wrongful arrest, they staged a mini sit-in and refused to leave the police station. Officers, becoming frustrated with the four women, punched one Adrienne Potts in the back of the head and pushed her to the ground. Eventually, the four returned to Brunswick House to try to find any witnesses of their unlawful arrest. However, what they found were two more police officers that arrested them again and charged them this time with obstruction of justice. The women were represented in court by a former federal cabinet minister, Judy LaMarche, who took the case pro bono in reaction to the public outcry to the story. Two of the women were eventually acquitted, but one, Adrienne, served three months probation. Incidents between the police and the LGBTQ community continued throughout the 70s and 80s, but it was the consistent action of the LGBTQ community and the supportive reactions of the mainstream society that eventually pushed for change. After two gay men were arrested for kissing at the corner of Bloor and Young in Toronto, a number of gay activists came out and staged a kiss-in at that same corner. In 1975, the NDP launched the Gay Caucus, one of the very first of its kind in the world to discuss issues facing the LGBTQ community. Over in Montreal, police crackdowns of gay bars on Stanley Street was widely viewed as being a part of Mayor Jean Drapeau's attempt to clean up the city before the 1976 Olympics, and it led to riots in the city. Again, in 1977, after police raided two gay businesses, a protest the next day was attended by over 2,000 people. By December of that year, Quebec had become only the second jurisdiction in the world after Denmark to pass a law banning discrimination based on sexual orientation. In 1981, the Toronto police raided four gay bathhouses in what they called Operation Soap. Although bathhouses have been raided before and would be raided again in Canada, this event is now considered one of the most important turning points in LGBTQ history in Canada and is now regarded as Canada's equivalent to the 1969 Stonewall Riots in New York City. Just less than 300 men were arrested, making it the largest mass arrest in Canadian history since the 1970 October Crisis and until the 2006 Stanley Cup playoffs in Edmonton. Large protests were organized against the actions taken by the Toronto Police which is now one of the world's largest pride festivals and has been bringing pride celebrations to the city of Toronto for nearly 40 years. Attitudes were slowly starting to change in Canada. Later that same year, in 1981, at a Halloween party at a gay bar in Toronto, for the first time a police presence was recording protecting gay spectators and drag queens from anti-gay harassment at the St. Charles Tavern. In 1992, then Justice Minister and Attorney General of Canada, Kim Campbell, announced that Canada was lifting its ban on homosexuals in the Canadian forces, allowing them to serve openly and to live on base with their partners. By 1995, a landmark Supreme Court decision on Egan v. Canada, where Jim Egan argued to get spousal benefits for his partner Jack Nesbitt. Although they would have been better off by each collecting their own pension, they saw this as an incredible way to push for the rights of same-sex couples in Canada. The court ruled that the freedom from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation is protected under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms 
and should be written into Section 15 of the 1982 Charter, which was left deliberately vague to allow for things like this to be written in. But the court also ruled against their application for spousal benefits. Nonetheless, this court decision solidified freedom from discrimination into Canadian law across the country and set the legal precedent for a number of other critical decisions that eventually lead to the legalization of same-sex marriage in Canada. By 2001, Joe Clark was the first Prime Minister to march in a Pride Parade by marching as the Grand Marshal for Calgary Pride. And then less than two years later, the Court of Appeals of Ontario rules in Halpern v. Canada that the common law definition of marriage as being between one man and one woman violates Section 15 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The decision immediately legalizes same-sex marriage in Ontario and opens the door to those Niagara Falls marriages and sets an important legal precedent which over the next two years will lead seven more provinces and one territory to have similar court decisions legalizing same-sex marriage in their jurisdictions. Finally, in 2005, the Federal Civil Marriage Act is passed, legalizing and recognizing same-sex marriage across the country and guaranteeing those couples the same rights, recognitions, and protections as a straight married couple has. The 2010 Winter Olympics in Vancouver hosted the first ever Pride House for LGBTQ athletes. And in 2012, Vancouver-born Jenna Telekova made international headlines by winning her legal battle, reversing her disqualification, and becoming the first transgender woman to ever compete in the Miss Universe pageant, winning one of four titles of Miss Congeniality. That same year, Nova Scotia passes Bill 140, the Transgendered Persons Protection Act which added both gender identity and gender expression to the list of things protected from harassment under the Nova Scotia Human Rights Act, followed very closely by a similar attempt at the federal level in 2013. Randall Garrison put forward private member bill C-279, which would extend human rights protection to transgender and transsexual individuals in Canada. The bill passed with unanimous support from the NDP, the Green Party, Le Bloc Québécois, and the Liberals, and even 18 members of the Conservative Party of Canada. Although Prime Minister Stephen Harper and a majority of his Conservative Party of Canada voted against the bill, it was able to pass, just to die on the table in the Senate when the parliamentary session ended, before it could ever receive royal assent. On February 4th of 2014, the City Council of St. John's, Newfoundland voted unanimously to fly the Pride flag for the duration of the 2014 Winter Olympics in direct protest to anti-gay laws in Russia. This quickly set off a national campaign that was joined by over 30 municipalities, seven provincial and territorial legislatures, and even the Montreal Olympic Stadium was lit in the rainbow colors. All three parties in the provincial legislature in Ontario, the PCs, the Liberals, and the NDP, submitted a letter to Queen's Park asking that the rainbow flag be flown for the duration of the Olympics. However, embarrassingly, Queen's Park had to respond to all three parties and say no, that the only flags that were legally allowed to fly were the flags of Ontario, the Canadian flag, and the Franco-Ontarian flag. So when MPPs returned to work on February 18th, their very first order of business was to pass a law allowing the rainbow flag to be flown at Queen's Park, which was passed unanimously by all three parties. In 2016, the ceremonial first kiss between a sailor and their partner after returning from active duty in the Canadian Navy was between two men for the very first time. And a year later, the rainbow flag was flown over Parliament Hill in Ottawa for the first time in history. In 2017, the Liberal government under Prime Minister Justin Trudeau began to make apologies to the LGBTQ2S community and started to make reparations. Records from the purge between the 1950s and the 1990s would be corrected by destroying them, and civil and military personnel that were wrongly fired from their jobs and lost their livelihoods will share in a $110 million settlement. At the same time, the government clarified that the 1992 direction allowing Canadian Forces personnel to serve openly extends to trans military personnel, and the military released information on using chosen names and uniform protocols. This was backed up by Bill C-16, which would add the words gender identity and gender expression to the Canadian Human Rights Act, and to the sections dealing with hate speech and hate crimes in the Criminal Code of Canada. This law passed in 2017 finally put the protection of people from discrimination into Canadian law no matter where they are on the gender spectrum after almost 30 years of trying. 
the reason Canada is perceived as being an open and progressive country towards the LGBTQ community is as a direct result of the small victories and the many little policy changes that needed to happen for us to get the rights that exist today. But what this doesn't mean is that there is no more homophobia in Canada, that there is no discrimination, and that LGBTQ people don't feel the weight of hate in some ways. Alongside every battle won, is one that we're still fighting. In 1991, the mayor of Hamilton refused to recognize a pride event, which led to protests across the city. The Ontario Human Rights Commission found the decision by the mayor discriminatory, and he was ordered to pay $5,000 in damages to Hamilton's Gay and Lesbian Alliance, and to issue the proclamation in 1995. He did end up doing it in 1995, but said that he would never again proclaim any special events for any organization in the city at all. In 1996, during the debate that eventually add to sexual orientation being included in the Canadian Human Rights Act, two MPs from the Reform Party were suspended for making very controversial comments. One said that employers should have every right to send their gay employees to the back of the shop, and the other said that school boards should have every right to fire a teacher that was gay. Even 12 years after this, a fringe candidate at an all-candidates debate organized for high school students in Sudbury answered a question on same-sex marriage by saying that all homosexuals should be executed. The candidate's comments were eventually investigated as a hate crime, but the public nature of the comments shocked many. Later that same year, a lesbian couple was attacked and assaulted on their way to pick up their son in Oshawa, Ontario, which led to over 300 people protesting at the Oshawa City Hall. The Durham Regional Police Service later announced that the incident would not be investigated as a hate crime, because the individual that attacked the couple never incited genocide, and never incited anyone else to join him in the attack. In 2010, as Canada was championing LGBTQ rights at the Winter Olympics in Vancouver, then Minister of Citizenship and Immigration, Jason Kenney, personally ordered the removal of any reference to Canada's openness, acceptance, and tolerance to the LGBTQ community in the new study materials for new immigrants. And yes, this being the same Jason Kenney that's now the Premier of Alberta, not that that should have come as a surprise to anyone. Hold up. The LGBTQ community in Canada continues to face situations of harassment and in some cases of extreme physical violence. In 2013, Kingston Police publicized a series of threatening letters that were received by a lesbian couple in the city from a group that calls themselves a small but dedicated group of Kingston residents devoted to removing the scourge of homosexuality in the city. That same year, the Toronto Police announced that a series of missing person cases in the Church and Wellesley area of the city, the Gay Village, may be connected. It would later be discovered that a serial killer was specifically targeting and killing gay men of South Asian and Middle Eastern descent in the city of Toronto. The killer, who wasn't arrested until 2018, killed eight men in the neighborhood. This put an incredible amount of stress and anxiety on the gay community, created a level of distrust between the black and brown gay communities and the Toronto police, and forced a number of people to feel uncomfortable coming out. Many of the tensions between the Toronto police, the Pride movement, and the Black Lives Matter movement in Toronto still exist and are incredibly important conversations to continue to have. Even as Pride Month has become more and more mainstream in Canada, there are still those who refuse to recognize why this month is important, and the reasons why everyone, no matter where you are on the sexual orientation or the gender identity spectrum, should celebrate Pride Month. Last year, in 2019, Pride Hamilton was violently disrupted by anti-LGBTQ protests. Then again this year, in 2020, Headlines and eyes turned towards the borderland region of Fort Francis, Ontario and International Falls, Minnesota, when the Council of Emo, Ontario voted down a resolution recognizing Pride Month. The mayor was quoted as saying that there is no discrimination here and that the town has to represent the other side of the coin. In direct response to the comments made by the mayor of Emo, the Borderland Pride organization in Fort Francis and International Falls has launched the Pride Lives Here campaign to show communities across the country that LGBTQ Pride lives there, that there are members of their communities that love and support people no matter who they are. No matter the opinions of a small town mayor, the community in Emo joins the rest of the country in celebrating Pride Month this June. 
and the town's church and grocery store are both proud to fly the rainbow flag. Today, Pride in Canada is a movement that welcomes everyone, no matter who they are or who they love. More Canadians feel safe coming out and being who they are as ever before, and are feeling the open arms of their community, accepting and loving them for exactly who they are. We don't actually know how many Canadians identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, because the Census of Canada doesn't actually ask Canadians about their sexual orientation. However, since same-sex marriage was legalized in 2005, the census has kept track of same-sex couples across the country. In 2006, there were approximately 7,500 same-sex couples in Canada. And by 2011, that number had actually gone up to 21,000 couples. And that only includes the big cities. See, Statistics Canada had a bit of an issue a couple years ago. Suddenly, they had over 4,500 male same-sex marriages in northern areas, most of them being in the Fort McMurray area of Alberta, which didn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Turns out there was a number of oil field workers in northern Alberta that had listed their primary addresses as being in Fort Mac and had other roommates that did the same thing. So when they listed themselves as married, even though their partner lived in a different province, and the census suddenly had a bunch of married men living in the same address, those pairings of married men in the same address were all counted as being same-sex marriages. Today, Toronto, Montreal, Calgary, Vancouver, Halifax, and Ottawa all host the largest Pride events, but they're joined by other Pride festivals, both large and small, in cities like Cranbrook, Kamloops, Kelowna, Nanaimo, New Westminster, Prince George, Victoria, Whistler, Fort McMurray, Grand Prairie, Jasper, Edmonton, Lethbridge, Medicine Hat, Red Deer, Moose Jaw, Prince Albert, Regina, Saskatoon, Brandon, Flintflon, Portage La Prairie, Steinbach, Thompson, Winnipeg, Belleville, Brockville, Cornwall, Durham, Elliott Lake, Sudbury, Hamilton, Kitchener-Waterloo, Guelph, the Halton Region, Kenora, Kingston, London, Muskoka, Niagara, North Bay, Peel, Peterborough, Richmond Hill, Sault Ste. Marie, Simcoe County, Thunder Bay, Timmins, Windsor, Quebec City, Kimuski, Shelbrook, Charlotte County, Fredericton, Miramichi, Moncton, St. John, Charlottetown, Antigonish, Pictou County, Sydney, Yarmouth, Cornerbrook, St. John's, Whitehorse, Norman Wells, Yellowknife, and Calhoun. Canada is well on its way to becoming a safe and welcoming country for the LGBTQ community and a champion for LGBTQ rights around the world. But that's not a given. The rights that are recognized in Canada come from the hard battles fought and won by those who came before us. Canada is as it is today because of those that pushed for change. The activists. Like Elsa Gidlow, Roswell George Mills, Barbara Thornborough, George Hislop, Jim Egan and Jack Nesbitt, Douglas Wilson, and Tommy Sexton. Canada is as it is today because of those that made change happen. The LGBTQ politicians both out and closeted throughout Canada's history. Those like Sven Robinson, Libby Davies, Kyle Ray, George Smitherman, Ted Nebeling, Claude Chavon, Kathleen Wynne, Jim Watson, Wade McLaughlin, Julie Green, Michael Connolly, and Estefania Cortez Vargas, who came out as non-binary on the floor of the Alberta legislature during a debate on the inclusion of transgender rights and pushed Alberta to use the neutral honorific member Cortez Vargas instead of the traditional Mr. or Mrs. in the public records in Hansard. What is most important for us to remember is that Canada is as it is today because of those that died for change. The lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender Canadians who were killed for being just who they are. Those like Kenneth Zeller, Joe Rose, Aaron Webster, Abu Basir Faizi, Hamid Kayan, Skanda Navaratnam, Sarush Mahmoudi, Andre Kinsman, Salim Essen, Dean Lasowick, Karushna Kumar Kandaratnam, Raymond Tavel, and Jamie Hubley. These people are the reason that we celebrate Pride. So that young Canadians who might feel a little bit different from their classmates might realize that they're not alone, that nothing is wrong with them, and that they're soon going to find a community that will love them, respect them, and support them for exactly who they are. This is why it was so painful when the Conservative leader and then candidate for Prime Minister Andrew Scheer publicly announced during the 2019 federal election that he would never personally march in a pride parade. It's not about what you might believe personally, Mr. Scheer. It's about showing all Canadians that you and your party respect them and support them for exactly who they are and who they love. No conditions attached. This is why we fly rainbow flags from coast to coast to coast every year. So on this World Pride Day, be who you are and celebrate it. It's the mosaic of all of our colors that makes this country so beautiful. Happy Pride, Canada.